Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is John Pullman. I'm the Executive Director of the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative, and we thank you for joining. Uh, this is a webinar for members of the ACLC, but we've invited a few guests to join us today, and we're grateful to have you. Just want to hit a couple housekeeping items here. I will be showing a screen and put a few images and graphs on. It's not essential uh, to see these to follow the conversation, uh, but you can log in to the Zoom webinar. You can do it on your computer or by phone. Uh, I'll send the slides afterwards uh, so you can see that information as well. Uh, we'll start with a number of questions. This is an interview, interview format, but there will be opportunities for you all to submit some questions. So be thinking of them along the way. Um, about two thirds of the way in, we'll post, uh, we'll open that up. Uh, you submit those questions just in the Zoom application. There's a little module that says questions in which you can type those in and we'll be watching for those. I just want to say at the top of the, um, uh, since we have a good audience of our members here, just to remind you of a few other things, really just save the date. Uh, June 7th is our next webinar. This is the status of Medicaid, ACOs, and their projected future. Uh, details will come in the weekly news. And the next ACLC member meeting is in October the 23rd and the 24th uh, in Washington, D.C. If you intend to uh, travel to the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, I'll just know that that's on Monday and then our dates are Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we'll get the calendar out, but we'll end in good time on the 24th. You can get back to your home that evening. Now on to our webinar. Um, we are grateful uh, to have uh, our two co-chairs here today from the ACLC. With us is Governor Mike Levitt. Uh, Governor Levitt is the founder and general partners of Levitt Partners, uh, formerly, he was the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency and Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, prior to that, he was a three-time elected governor of Utah. And in fact, uh, Governor Levitt and I are in Salt Lake City now. Welcome, Governor. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a delight to be here, John. Thank and you. I'm happy to be here with Mark as well. <laughs> Indeed. Mm -hmm. And Mark McClellan. Um, Mark is the director of the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy. I'm the Margolis Professor of Business, Medicine, and Health Policy at Duke University. Mark also spent time with you at HHS uh, and in the government. He was the former administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Mark, welcome. Uh, great to be here with you all, too. All right. I also want to thank uh, Western Governors University. This is where the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative is housed, so we're grateful for their support and their support in advancing uh, value in healthcare. Well, today's topic is the next five years of healthcare. We had a lot of registrants for this webinar, so apparently it is of uh, some interest and top of mind for a number of individuals. Uh, I just want to ask a sort of a high-level question that's both you, Governor. Perhaps we can start with you, and I'll pose the question: um, Why are the next five years so uncertain? Why are so many people joining this? Uh, what are the key dynamics at play? And then, Mark, why don't you follow that follow that up with? Um, uh, so the first one: Why are the next five years so uncertain? And then, Mark, why don't you do why the next five years are so important? Well, I'll invite um, Mark to join in on uh, your question to me, uh, but I would suggest that the future is always uncertain. Um, certainly in healthcare, with the dynamic as uh, with dynamics as um, replete as we have today. But I do think we ought to focus not just on the uncertainty. We ought to acknowledge that we're in a period of greater certainty than we've had the last five years. Uh, we now know, for example, um, that the Affordable Care Act will be the statutory underpinning of health care. Uh, we did not know that with certainty the last five years, but now that the legislative process has played out, uh, we, I think, can say that with confidence. Uh, we now know uh, that the Secretary of Health, Alex Azar, is committed uh, to driving value-based care on behalf of the federal government, the world's largest payer. Uh, he, he, he made very direct comments about this uh, in his first policy statement, basically saying um, we don't have a choice. We have to move forward. 
uh, away from a system that pays by transaction to one that rewards value. And I, I, I thought one of the more interesting things he said was, I, we're prepared to use the federal government to drive that. Now, uh, that's a very important statement, and, I, and therefore I think brings a degree of certainty that we have not had uh, in, in the past. Uh, I, I think we can also uh, acknowledge the fact that we're we are uh, in a period when where we're making progress uh, in in terms of m this this transition. So yes, there's a lot of uncertainties. So there's uncertainties about the economy. There's uncertainties about the politics, and we may see a change in Congress. I don't think that changes the nature of where we are. It just means more gridlock if there's a if you have a divided government. So yes, uncertainty, but Look, looking forward, well, there's less uncertainty than there might have been looking back. Mark? I just uh, add to the point about certainty in the area of payment reform. Um, you highlighted uh, Secretary Azar's commitment. I think that is starting to play out in actual concrete activities. A uh, notable one early is the arrival at CMMI of a new director, Adam Bowler, who has extensive experience in new payment models. In fact, his uh, former company, uh, Landmark, which provides uh, comprehensive, uh, uh, coordinated, and prevention-oriented care for complex seniors, only is possible because of that movement that you highlighted away from fee-for-service. It's an organization that takes on full accountability for these very high-cost, high-risk patients. And I think uh, aside from the, uh, the, the, the certainty uh, of uh, commitment to moving in this direction, I just would emphasize the importance uh, in that cost growth is up uh, overall, uh, a bit higher uh, projections for the, the, this past year and, and heading into this year than before. So the cost pressures are not uh, going away. The, the federal uh, spending and support pressures uh, with the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, staying around or uh, we're looking at um, some uh, substantial uh, deficit outlook. So that's going to create some more pressure for finding ways to deliver care more efficiently. But also, I like, just want to highlight how care is changing. Um, it is certainly not widespread yet, but we're seeing more and more models being implemented and certainly being discussed that are just fundamentally different ways of de delivering care, much more uh, team-oriented, focused on um, patients getting services at home, uh, using medical treatments that are about preventing the complications of diseases before they happen, and using big data and analytics to target the right combination of both these medical services as well as uh, uh, social supports and, and uh, steps to try to influence uh, uh, behavior, things that haven't been a strong part of traditional health care. Um, that's a, a huge path to value, but it just doesn't work with traditional fee-for-service payments. So both on the, the cost side and on the uh, in terms of opportunities for integrated, prevention-oriented, personalized care, um, the, the, the pressures for moving in this direction are just going to keep rising. Uh, Mark, uh, I, I would add, we, we've been talking about this in the context of what's certain and what's uncertain. And, and we've highlighted the commitment of the federal government and so forth. But we also, I think, should flag that the certainty, the great certainty in my mind, is that this is being driven by economic pressure that is a global economic dispassionate force that's driving our government and uh, our industries uh, to find more efficient ways of doing things. We're competing with the world and we have a comparative disadvantage not in the quality of our care, but in the way our care is, what it costs. And so if you're competing with uh, a, 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 a China or an India, or, and they have costs of, of health care that are in the 6 or 7% of their gross domestic product, and we're competing with 20, uh, that's going to have an impact. And I think we also ought to acknowledge that the tax bill, uh, which has passed with great acclaim, it, it still adds another trillion and a half dollars to that deficit. And it's going to be the deficit, ultimately, that I think forces what Secretary Azar uh, has been speaking about 
to begin to find more efficient ways of doing things. That's what's driving this. And it's, it is a glacial like force. It is not subject to, poli uh, to, to politics. It happens no matter what. And I think when we talk about uncertainty and certainty, we have to keep focused there. The timing is a bit uncertain, but the outcome is not. Yeah, Governor, could I ask a little bit on timing? Uh, it seems there's been concern for a long time about uh, the amount of dollars and the tax puts more pressure on that. But when is it so much that dramatic change, either party has to address it? What are the signs of that? Well, it's likely uh, not something that it happens. It, it happens gradually. And like everything in the natural world, then there's an event that is triggered by some molecule tripping and some something cascades. And you see that in the economic world. In 2007, 2008, we had a liquidity crisis that no one saw coming. The signs were there, but it didn't happen gradually. It happened quickly. And that's the way these economic events occur. They're, they're, I mean, someone referred to them as black swans. When this black swan swims up, swims up it's a, an anomaly, but it triggers. And then everyone looks and says, we should have been substantially better uh, better prepared. I mean, I, I, someone once said about things like this, that the, the dilemma is that what you do now before it happens seems like it's overreaction. Uh, when, it, when you're looking back and saying, why didn't we do it before that? It, look, look, it looks as though you were inadequately prepared. Mm -hmm. So the reason I think we have to continue to look at this is this is, this is going to occur, whether it's tomorrow or and, and I've often said uh, recently that I think we're about 25 years through a 40-year transformation. And uh, th these things don't happen quickly, but they happen over time. And, but there are triggering events in the economy that begin to drive them. Uh, it reminds me of when you were secretary of HHS, which was around the time of pandemic flu, your scary beginning to a speech was pandemics aren't about if, they're about when. when? Um, and I look. I, I this is not a doomsday. I'm very optimistic, actually, about what's <laughs> happening. But the reality is, it's going to be driven by by moments in time when the economy doesn't do as well and people are scrambling. Right now, we're in a period of some abundance, and uh, it's the, that old story about the you know the, the the years of famine and the years of plenty. You want to be. This is not about storing away money. It's about storing up preparation uh, and gaining competencies, beginning to, uh, to, to lead. This is the time to do that. Um, Governor, you mentioned some international uh, comparisons, other countries. One thing a number of countries do is price setting. And we've seen in California um, some uh, movement on maybe doing some price setting. Uh, Mark, you and I were talking about this um, just earlier. What is, is, is that sort of a is that a potential future that we could see across the country uh, among different scenarios? I think that's a kind of response to the governor's comments to uh, the rising concerns about uh, high cost of care. I mean, one uh, short-term way to get costs down is to regulate the prices more uh, in intensively. And California has focused on drugs to some extent, but there are other states that are taking steps in the direction of um, uh, total responding to this um, concern about uh, rising overall costs and, and crowding out other state or, or national or, or family priorities. Um, I do think there are more effective ways to get there. Some of the most promising approaches are not about uh, uh, keeping the same fee-for-service delivery system in place, but getting more um, innovation around putting care together in new ways. So uh, changing the, the quantities of services as well as the prices, um, and uh, maybe having some focus on how we get the cost of an episode of care down or how we get the cost of uh, caring for a population of patients down. That's what a lot of the value-based care efforts and uh, reforms are really about, but they are running against the clock and the, the pressure of these uh, outside forces created by rising costs and concerns about access to care in the short term. I, I, John and Mark, I, I think this actually is the great divide, uh, not just on health care, but specifically on health care is 
how do we deal with what is now the reality of these pressures? Uh, there are uh, there was a report put out by the the uh, Healthcare Cost uh, Institute that indicated this is two months ago that that uh, I think up through 2016 healthcare uh, utilization was actually down, but prices were dramatically up. Now, when you look at that equation, you say to yourself, how can utilization be down and prices up? It, it conjures in people's mind a, a market that's not working. And so there's a, the, the political divide is how do you deal with that? Okay, we've got a price problem. Uh, if you talk to Republicans, they'll say, we simply need to have a better market and that will give consumers the information they need and they will demand higher quality at lower prices and that's the most efficient way to do it because government will foul it up. Uh, the Democrats, on the other hand, will say, look, we've got a problem, it's a higher prices and so we need to use the force of government to be able to set the prices. And so it's, it's, a, it's really a function of the question, what's the role of government? Now, I think both Republican and Democrat do seem to agree. One of the few things you can get them to agree on is that the fee-for-service payment system is the problem, and that for a solution to emerge, we have to shift from that payment problem. And so in my mind, again, going back to the theme of certainties, I think that's one of the certainties is that you can get political agreement on on the uh, uh, on on coordinated care being better than uncoordinated care that that we have models now that tell us this is a superior way to do it if we can do it fast enough otherwise as mark said there's going to be a default to, uh, to price setting hmm. um i want to do just a couple more questions on government as a driver um and and then moving some care delivery uh a lot of people don't know that uh, if you look at past administrations, um, back to the value-based care movement, uh, evidence that is bipartisan, you and uh, Governor, you and uh, Dr. McClellan were there uh, when the PGP demo was started, which is really the predecessor to the Pioneer ACO program. Then, of course, we saw under the Obama administration, you know, MSSPs, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, there was um, this pause when Secretary Price came in. And it seemed the um, the administration was uh, uncertain, and now it seems Secretary Azar is fanning the flames. Um, Governor, does the government set the pace for the transition to value, or would it ever move on its own? I think the most important lesson I learned uh, as Secretary of Health was if you want to reform health care in America, you have to change Medicare because it it drives the only payment system that is universal throughout the country. Every pharmacy, every durable medical equipment uh, dealer, every long-term care uh, provider, every hospital, every surgeon, every anesthesiologist, every physical therapist, every drugstore, everyone operates on this payment structure. And the private insurers uh, basically copy that and they may make their own modifications to it, but it is the foundation of medical payment. So if you want to change healthcare, then you have to begin dealing with the public payment structure. And I think that's why what Alex Azar said was important. I think if I remember his words, he said, we're going to be, we're going to intervene and the words were even to an uncomfortable degree for a, an administration that um, believes in competition and markets. Well, that to me was a very important statement. And it is different than, than Secretary Price. Uh, I, I do think there was a bit of a lull. It, it put everybody into uncertainty about whether or not this administration was going to drive forward on this bipartisan thought. And I, I personally believe that he had concerns about it that were born from his um, uh, days as a physician. And uh, they were understandable, but it did put a pause. I think that we're now through that, and we're starting to see momentum again. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, we've, we've alluded multiple times to these comments from Secretary Azar, so I want to read three quotes. I'll show them on the screen, too. Um, and then, Mark, maybe you can also comment on sort of what, 
what influence these words alone will have. Um, so first quote, this administration, you just mentioned this governor, this administration and president, this administration, this president are not interested in incremental steps. We are unafraid of disrupting existing arrangements. Second one, it will require some degree of federal intervention, perhaps even an uncomfortable degree. That may sound surprising coming from an administration that deeply believes in the power of markets and competition. And then uh, near the end of his speech, he said, there is no turning back to an unsustainable system that pays for procedures rather than value. In fact, the only option is to charge forward for HHS to take bolder action and for providers and payers to join with us. Uh, on this last quote, I'll just know when I pulled up the speech on HHS website, this was the clip they put right there at the top essentially saying this is, the, this is the message they want people to get if there's only one thing uh, coming out of it. Uh, Mark, so far these are words. Um, what, what needs to happen now? I mean, is this, is this a signal also to the commercial industry, to providers, to commercial payers? Uh, what, what's the message to this? And then what does CMS need to do really to back this up? Yeah, I, I think it is a, a, a real message and an important step. And just to pick up on uh, the the governor's comments about how um, a, aggressive intervention um, is actually a conservative approach. You know, conservatives have, have approached this two ways. Um, one way of looking at conservatism is, well, leave leave what's there in place. But the other way is recognizing that you know what's a conservative um, uh, solution here that in, enables um, healthcare providers to do things in new ways and give, gives people new opportunities to. Uh, to save money, um, it's really hard to do in a fee-for-service payment system um, where the prices are all set by regulation, the ability of um, uh, healthcare providers to innovate in care delivery models is uh, is, is pretty limited. And I, I think that's the, um, the, the Secretary Azar view, that there's a, a lot of government intervention already in Medicare, and the, the problem is that it's uh, getting in the way of uh, a lot of private sector innovation. So if you want that kind of disruption that we've seen in other industries, well, you're gonna to have to be uh, pretty aggressive about uh, fee-for-service payment and, and other federal policies that reinforce it. And it's still early days for uh, Secretary Azar. You know, there are a couple of notable steps I'd uh, mentioned already is the announcement of the um, uh, bundle payments for care initiative advanced uh, version. Uh, that is still voluntary, but it's a significantly bigger step uh, intended to be in terms of more um, shift towards uh, accountability for uh, costs and outcomes over 90 days among the participating organizations. They've uh, uh, also signaled that they want to do more work in the area of specialized care uh, to complement the uh, efforts around primary care and ACO. And another um, early uh, development from the administration is around uh, data sharing, where uh, they have really highlighted, and I think people haven't picked up on this enough, the desire to make uh, payment and care reform more directly involve patients and consumers, including Medicare beneficiaries. So it's no accident that one of his early announcements was about this um, version 2.0 of um, Medicare data sharing and uh, effort to get commitments and maybe even requirements uh, of uh, private health insurance plans to share data with um, individuals in an easy to use way through so-called open APIs uh, and potentially to make it easier for uh, healthcare organizations that are taking care of patients to, to, to get that information and to, uh, as well to make it easier for patients who are participating in uh, these new payment and care models to uh, get uh, some of the shared savings themselves um, when they take steps to uh, choose better care systems and, and lower costs. So, so early days on those themes, but I think you can see some uh, of the directions uh, emerging. Um, I think the important thing to watch on further action is what happens now that there is a, a new uh, leadership team at CMMI in place, one that uh, is certainly going to take some new directions in this uh, movement towards um, value-based care and payment reform, maybe a bigger emphasis, as I said, on some models of uh, specialized care that can fit into the whole ACO framework, uh, maybe some further steps on ACOs to encourage 
uh, more of a shift away from fee for service than many organizations have been able to achieve with just the so-called shared savings only uh, versions of uh, payment reforms. And I, I know the uh, CMMI team is uh, working uh, very hard on these next steps right now. So uh, a lot to watch over the next few months. Right. Thank you. Um, we know that uh, there are really two parts of the story to transitioning to value, and we just spoke a lot about payments. Um, the other side of the equation is care delivery. And uh, frankly, that's the harder part. Um, transforming the way providers deliver care. Um, and part of this, we've seen really a lot of providers as they get into this, um, on aggregate who enter into value-based contracts don't do as well in the early years. Um, Governor, how can, um, how can providers shorten this learning curve? And I'm gonna pull up here in just a minute um, a graph that shows how uh, early adopters of, in the Medicare Shared Savings Program didn't do as well at the beginning, but then slowly got a little better. And I'll even, I think this goes into the reason you and Dr. McClellan started the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative, but maybe just speak to how do, you, how do organizations get there faster? There are competencies that have to be developed, acquired, or in some other way um, uh, found um, that most healthcare organizations don't have at this point. It, many of the organizations, most organizations have very little experience, for example, with managing risk or taking economic responsibility. Their whole culture is based on a fee-for-service payment structure. The, the executive's background, all uh, uh, in a fee-for-service uh, 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 system. We've had a fee-for-service system for more than 60 years. Entire careers have been spent. And so moving to these new payment models, moving to a more, a more integrated system where different things are valued is a huge transition. So we should not be surprised that there is a learning curve that has to be overcome. Now, how, how do we accelerate that? Well, every, everyone has to learn these new behaviors, has to learn new systems, has to have to invent new ways of doing things. But if we're all having to invent it ourselves, then it's just destined to be slower. Uh, when when um, uh, Mark um, and I were at HHS, we had a lot of time dealing with quality standards. That was another new step. How, how do you measure quality? Well, I, I came to conclude that there were three ways you could begin to establish standards. One was you could have the government set the standards, and that probably wouldn't work because we'd get it wrong. Two, you could just wait for the last vendor standing, uh, which wouldn't work because there'd be lots of different ways to do things. Or third, you could use a collaborative approach and people could then figure out how to adapt to that. I think the same thing applies in accelerating the movement toward value. We can all try to do it on our own uh, and it will take a long time. Uh, we can work together collaboratively and begin not to establish the one way to do it, but begin to share our learnings. And that's what the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative has done. It's not just a place where people, where all of you come together to meet and talk. I mean, we're, we're very uh, systematically documenting what people are learning and iterating what they're learning. And that kind of working together will accelerate the readiness. That's the big inhibitor right now is that people are still working through the curve. Mark, any, any comments to that? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging curve. And as we found in the, um, in the learning collaborative, uh, time does help, uh, but also uh, a systematic approach to understanding the whole set of organizational uh, capability changes that need to occur uh, is also very helpful. The, the idea behind the ACLC is to turn this uh, four or five year learning curve, which can seem pretty daunting, into something that's much tighter and uh, starts uh, uh, having a, a payoff sooner uh, rather than uh, several years out. And I think the good news is there, there are organizations who are succeeding 
uh, at doing this. And not only that, there are uh, vehicles like the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative that can bring together these different perspectives and create a kind of science and, and um, support capability uh, around making the transition faster. And as, as you all know, uh, John and, and, and Governor Levitt, uh, uh, we are really focusing the ACLC effort on how to make these changes, both overall in organizations, uh, how they've been done most successfully, and highlighting uh, key areas where uh, transitions uh, need to occur for uh, for complex patients, for for uh, integrating post-acute care services, and and for uh, other uh, key areas of uh, of care reform. Mark, you advise a lot of um, provider organizations that are making these first steps. Uh, we in the ACLC have created this Accountable Care Atlas, which um, tries to identify all of the competencies provider organizations need in um, sequentially uh, in developing uh, a good organization that can handle risk-based payment models. This is not just designed for ACOs. As you've worked with organizations, where do you find um, organizations underestimate the difficulty the most? Um, where what what is uh, what what lies ahead that they don't really notice until they get into it and, and have the hardest time picking up and, and, and catching up? Well, I think that the hard part of this is being able to work on several tracks at the same time. And what we found is, you know, if you look at this slide, there are a lot of specific elements on it. But uh, from a conceptual standpoint, um, four big categories to think about are uh, changes in, in governance, which includes leadership and organizational culture, as well as uh, taking steps to uh, begin to organize around uh, people and, and coordinated integrated services rather than uh, uh, specific uh, uh, discrete services. Um, finance, and um, a lot of people think these are big investments that need to be made uh, up front to, to achieve uh, uh, savings that are going to take uh, years to occur. Um, what we found is that um, this was some good financial planning and, and careful analysis of uh, opportunities for improvement. It's it's possible to focus in on more incremental steps that lead to fundamental change and a, a better return on investment. Um, health IT, data and analytics, really important. Um, a lot of people have focused on some complex and, and big uh, data system changes when in fact uh, it's possible to get some significant care improvements in the short term by focusing on some specific key data elements that are important, like uh, steps to identify high-risk patients who are not getting uh, uh, appropriate care that can uh, lead to a limited number of targeted interventions that uh, uh, that will pay off. And, you know, everybody thinks about uh, the, the care delivery changes as part of this, but without that foundation of uh, a, a structural reform path and governance reform path and uh, thoughtful uh, financial investments and uh, data and analytics support, uh, it's really hard to implement, um, uh, to choose and implement specific care reforms for specific patients uh, that do pay off. There's a lot of stuff out there in terms of care delivery reforms that sound good, using telemedicine services, using community health workers, uh, team-based approaches to care, changes in uh, care pathways. Um, but uh, these other steps are really important uh, for giving an organization confidence that when it does make uh, specific changes in its care models, which can be, again, incremental and add up to more over time, uh, they're actually going to pay off. I, I will add one other comment. I think the movement of culture, I mentioned it earlier, but the movement, there's a culture that's, that's created around fee-for-service. Uh, it's payment systems, but it's also uh, uh, the way we look at care and the way we we uh, integrate care. Um, we've now been talking about this uh, as a as a health care community for more than ten years, probably fifteen years, and in the using the words value, using the word value based. That's a when I was secretary, uh, one of my objectives was to have the word value become part of the lexicon of American healthcare. Because literally, it, when I was, uh, started as secretary, people weren't talking like this. I'm not taking credit for it. I'm just saying that this has been a long iteration. 
but despite that, I mean, the, the C-suite in most healthcare organizations, they get this. They see it. They're beginning to think about it. Uh, but when you get down a layer or two or three, people aren't thinking about this. And so there are things happening in their world that they don't fully appreciate or understand. And I think that's a, 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 a something we've got to pay attention to. There's got to be a more broadly based understanding mm -hmm. of why this is happening, what it means, how it improves care. I think it creates an atmosphere where this can move more quickly once we have the competencies well-defined. Uh, Governor, it seems to relate. Uh, I've been asked the question, why is the ACLC housed at Western Governors University? Uh, it seems there might be a connection there. Could, could you answer that? Uh, yes. I, uh, first of all, we wanted this to be done in a nonprofit environment. And Western Governors University is a nonprofit university that was established by uh, 20 uh, governors uh, in the late 90s. It's been a quite, frankly, miraculous story. Uh, they are now the largest college of health in America with 13,000 students. They offer bachelor's and master's degrees. Uh, they now produce, uh, for example, one out of every eight uh, nurse educators in, in America. Uh, I won't, but they also then have begun to uh, delve more into uh, uh, training managers, but they have a model that's different, and that is what appealed to us, I believe. The model is that they don't use an, the, the traditional system of academic credit. They define competencies that are required, and then they allow students to learn in the best way they can on the time frame that they can, and they advance them on the basis of their uh, uh, ability to demonstrate competency. Now, that will sound a lot like what we're going through in healthcare in trying to uh, actually define the competencies, uh, teach the competencies, and then demonstrate the competencies. And so we wanted their methodology, frankly. But the third thing that was important was um, that we had reach. They have uh, students and alumni in, in every state in America. Uh, and they, have, they, they operate online, which gives us a very modern and quite uh, prolific way of distributing content once we have it developed. Okay. Um, Mark, I'm going to give you one more question, and then uh, I will go with the questions from the audience. Uh, I have a few, a number have already been submitted, some that I received even before this webinar began. Uh, we'll try and get through as many of these um, as we can. Uh, Mark, what role do you see the ACLC playing five years from now? We talked about the five-year projection. Um, what are we going to be? What are we going to be doing? Well, we, we started out by working collaboratively to define competencies that our members find uh, useful for their initial steps into uh, accountable care and uh, now increasingly in, uh, in more advanced areas. Um, what I think we're, we're seeing now in, in the ACLC is that while this overall framework is helpful as a reference point, there are lots of specific areas where uh, additional resources to help organizations uh, move forward and to provide a, a facilitated and focused way to uh, learn about and understand the experiences of their colleagues in specific areas uh, is really helpful. I mean, there are a lot of conferences and, uh, and papers out there you can read about different aspects of uh, accountable care. Um, this is, as uh, Governor Levitt emphasized, an approach that emphasizes uh, systematization um, that uh, um, uh, enables you to see a kind of more comprehensive uh, picture rather than uh, just uh, isolated pieces. And I think over the next five years, we're going to refine those capabilities a lot uh, with uh, additional resources available in, in specific areas of interest to uh, our members. And uh, those might include uh, different areas of specialized care, end of, end of life or advanced illness care. Um, uh, I mentioned the work that we're doing now around uh, integration of uh, post-acute care services uh, and long-term services and supports into, uh, uh, into care models. Um, this is exactly the, the uh, strategy that, that we described of trying to make it uh, easier and faster 
uh, to, to move forward on the successful implementation of accountable care. And just to go back to where we started, uh, uh, we see these as being uh, very useful tools and a, a very much a community-based approach to accelerate progress on this fundamental challenge of getting more value in, in, in healthcare uh, in the United States. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a few questions that have come in. Um, one from the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, um, good members and friends of ours, ask, what is the role of state health departments in this new value-based economy? Um, how should these state health departments be organized to contribute? Uh, Governor, you've been on the state level. One of the competencies that is, is required uh, that, we're, frankly, we're just starting to really focus on as a, as a healthcare community are the social determinants of health. Um, as providers begin to assume financial responsibility, I think it becomes more and more evident that unless you're looking upstream to find the things that are actually driving healthcare costs, you're not going to be able to harness them. Now, this is one of the basic uh, flaws of the fee-for-service system, where people were actually um, made economically better off by the more patients that they had uh, and the more care they gave them. Uh, whereas with uh, the whole movement toward value, uh, we're going to give people the right care and keep them healthy and be rewarded for that. Well, part of that has to be systems of uh, uh, social systems, uh, how we deal with uh, um, er early uh, childhood birth, uh, or premature birth rather, how, how we deal with opioids and addictions and things that drive health care costs. Uh, public health is right at the heart of that. And the truth is, I don't believe in the long run, in the 40 year span, that we can do this without a, a, a focused concentration at the public health level. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm going to send this next one to you. This is uh, from Rhonda Toller from the American College of Cardiology. Uh, Rhonda asks, if Secretary Azar is very committed to payment reform and new models, why has the Secretary's response to the PTAC recommendations been so slow for models recommended either for limited testing uh, and or implementation? Yeah, that's a that's a good question that I think a lot of people are asking, and um, I think that you're you're going to see some some progress there where the the models line up. If you, if you think about sort of big picture on the CMMI models, there've been a, a set related to primary care, uh, set related to to population health, the ACOs, uh, uh, and uh, maybe specialized versions of ACOs like ones for patients with end stage renal disease and and, and the like. And then a start at some models that deal with areas of specialized care, like that BPCI advanced um, program uh, for um, major procedures and for uh, hospitalizations for, for, for major acute uh, events. And I think that's likely to remain a um, core part of Medicare's uh, payment reform strategy, because they're kind of all about moving from a um, uh, that uh, fee for service or, or specific service by specific specialty uh, focus that we talked about earlier and into more of a, a patient uh, focus at the level of you know integrating their 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 care or at the level of um, uh, uh, care for a specialized uh, condition or, or or event and I think some of the PTAC models that have emerged so far have been a little bit hard for um, CMS staff to, to integrate into that approach. Um, I think with the new leadership at CMMI, as I mentioned earlier, that is, uh, is likely to be very focused on um, uh, specialized care and, and, and new opportunities for, for specialized uh, providers to uh, get some direct support in alternative payment models. Uh, I think you'll see that accelerate, but probably more at the level of um, dealing with um, uh, conditions and, and bigger bigger problems for patients rather than um, um, you know, sort of very um, provider focused models and I think that's a, a kind of inherent talent challenge between a, a, a PTAC that was set up to be uh, physician focused and a lot of specialists have kind of assumed that means well there's going to be a, a model for my specialty and then this you know more fundamental shift that's happening towards 
you know, really switching the focus to, uh, to, to, to more integrated and coordinated care for, for, for people. Um, so uh, maybe just in the area of cardiology, uh, um, there, there's been a, a lot of interest in extending some of the um, specialized models like uh, the BPCI for um, uh, acute myocardial infarction, heart attack, and for um, major cardiac procedures into what could be a more um, chronic um, management model that involves cardiologists and, and uh, related uh, specialties in um, preventing uh, those uh, hospitalizations for heart failure, exacerbations, or, or heart attacks, or, or maybe heads off the uh, the need for some of the procedures. And uh, there, there is some more work that needs to happen on PTAC for, for aligning with that strategy, uh, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more progress and, and more guidance coming from, from CMMI on how to do that under their new leadership. Thank you. Um, Governor's one here on um, large-scale vertical integration. I think it's an interesting um, topic. This is uh, Joel James from Signature Medical Group. Um, Ask if you were concerned with the large-scale vertical integration going on, uh, payers and other entities buying up PBMs, physician groups, even drugstore chains, as we're seeing now. Is this good for reining in healthcare costs? Like every other industry, um, we're going to have to find the balance between scale um, and and uh, non or, or anti-competitive behavior. And this is a place where the government will have to play. I don't think there's a hard rule. But I do think we have to acknowledge that as people work to develop scale and as they work uh, in order to compete, uh, there will be combinations and many of them uh, will uh, begin to um, assemble um, uh, competencies that are, uh, that, that are not their own, but that are, um, that, that are adjacent to them. I think the whole idea uh, around the um, uh, the, the CVS Aetna transaction, for example, or the one that's at least being discussed right now between Walmart and and Humana. Uh, people initially thought that the CVS um, and Aetna transaction was about their PBM. I don't think that at all. Uh, I think that what the, they recognized was that there are certain competencies that they – CVS could not develop on their own. They were better off buying. It could get there. And most of them were related to risk and the aggregation of lives. Um, so I, I think we're going to see more of this. And uh, CVS obviously has a drugstore on lots of corners in America, and they're beginning to use clinics. And, they've, and, and when we were talking about years ago, the transformation in a similar way about the telecommunications industry, um, which, by the way, took about 40 years, uh, the conversation revolved around how do you get the last quarter mile of fiber? Uh, copper wires wouldn't carry the data fast enough. And so um, they, they had to get fiber into homes. Well, in healthcare, the, the, the last quarter mile version is how do you get care points that people find convenient and where you can deliver primary care. Well, that one solution to that might be Walgreens or CVS or Walmart, and they all seem to be using that asset as a means. Is that vertical integration? Well, it's, it's beginning to align competencies. And so, yes, there's a place where behavior could become anti-competitive, and that's why we have government. But there are other times when the market will very naturally find ways of aligning that give more efficiency and better care. Thank you. If I could just uh, add to this, um, the, as, as the governor emphasized, the, these uh, one way of viewing these reforms is about uh, being able to deliver more uh, integrated, coordinated care that, that's more convenient through more um, neighborhood-based locations like a, a pharmacy. Uh, I would emphasize, though, that uh, just putting the organizations together uh, does not by the by itself uh, create those um, those kinds of competencies. You need to go back to our um, uh, kind of ACLC um, uh, um, framework around uh, the competencies that are needed. Uh, um, CBS and Aetna are going to have some real challenges ahead around uh, governance and setting up a structure that uh, uh, integrates those uh, services around 
uh, financing uh, new kinds of uh, uh, care coordination and delivery around integrating their, their IT capabilities and then actually setting up models that have uh, uh, the capacity to deliver uh, not just a physical location, but, but well-coordinated uh, primary care linked into specialty services. And there are a lot of other efforts that involve different kinds of consolidation underway today to try to get there too. Some of the, the um, regional hospital uh, consolidation uh, efforts and, and vertical integration between hospitals and uh, primary care and, and, and other medical uh, specialties and some of the you know, more disruptive approaches that involve uh, uh, things like uh, new primary care uh, uh, groups, um, uh, One Medical, Lineman Healthcare, and so forth. Um, none of those have clearly succeeded and dominated the, uh, the market yet, but uh, while that's going on, I think you're going to see the, the administration uh, try to take some steps, maybe not just through antitrust enforcement, but through uh, steps in the way that they design their payment models, such as these models that are intended to support innovative kinds of specialty care delivery um, that would facilitate disruption while addressing some of the concerns about uh, consolidation that might otherwise go along with it. Great. Thank, thank you. Let's, we'll do one more question uh, that we received coming in, and then we'll go to some final comments. Um, this one comes from uh, Jerry Meklaus from Accenture uh, about the recent JAMA study, um, uh, which is really compelling and interesting, uh, that talked about that implicates, I guess, prices rather than utilization as the root cause of the U.S. difference in total spend. Uh, what those implications uh, implications could be, I guess, on the value of movement in general, but also on ACOs. Um, Mark, did you did you read that? Any comments on prices versus utilization? Yeah, government? so that article is written by uh, some of my colleagues who have done uh, a lot of thinking about um, how care is delivered in the U.S. and abroad, and that's the I think the best effort yet to try to develop more comparable data on what's going on in the, the U.S. and other countries. Um, I would strongly urge people who read that article to also read an uh, accompanying. Uh, editorial by Kate Baker and Amitabh Chandra, which um, I think uh, appropriately gives the article a lot of kudos for putting together data and trying to understand how uh, practices are different, but also points out some of the limitations and challenges. Uh, for example, um, in the U.S., compared to many of these other countries, we're doing um, both more intensive things on a hospital day and also doing a, a, delivering a lot of services in um, the, the outpatient, outpatient and community-based setting that um, many other countries aren't doing, and it's uh, hard with available data to, to, to capture that. Um, I do think that, as we've talked about earlier, this is uh, yet another indication that our care is too expensive. Uh, and that there are ways to, there should be ways to deliver it uh, at, a, at a lower cost. Uh, my hope is that it will highlight the importance of making progress in the, uh, in the payment models and in getting to uh, ways that we really can measure uh, more from a patient standpoint. You know, if you, uh, instead of just the number of hospital days and the, 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 the number of drugs and the, and the average price of drugs, uh, what are people getting uh, that's the best possible care uh, at the lowest possible cost? And what are the differences between countries, uh, not just from a service standpoint, hospitals, physician services, and, and the like, which are really hard to, to measure accurately uh, across countries, but uh, uh, from a, a, a care delivery standpoint uh, as well. So um, uh, Ash Jaw, one of the authors, is, is also very much involved in the um, the, the push towards um, uh, accountable care, and uh, I hope that uh, we'll be able to develop some studies over the next few years that are not so focused on international comparisons at the level of, you know, specific hospital services and, and uh, physician services, and, and which are hard to measure, but are more focused on people. How, who's got the best model of care for for, for or for um, uh, a heart disease uh, prevention or for advanced illness and, and end-of-life care uh, and uh, how do we advance those? I'll just say that I looked at that study and thought well here we go uh, we're going this is going to tee up the great political debate 
uh, for 2018 and 2020 and maybe 2022. And the debate is not is that problem, does that problem exist, but what do we do about that problem? I mentioned this earlier. Uh, if we, uh, as, a, as, a, as a healthcare community, can design a system that holds people accountable, not just for utilization, but for prices, where the marketplace is able to choose someone who serves them well at a price that they think is fair and that where they have choices, I, I think we will see a system that will mature rapidly. On the other hand, if we fail and we continue to have lower utilization, in other words, people are getting less care and they're paying more for it, that's a bad system. And there will be people who will step in and say, we have to solve that and we have to use government to intervene in that way. So we're in a bit of a race here. And I think that is, can we as a healthcare system create an environment for innovation and where our patients have choice? Or are we going to move to a system that essentially operates like a regulated utility? Now, there are merits of a regulated utility in certain areas. I would argue there's not a merit for regulated utilities in the healthcare sector because it will stifle innovation, it will take away choice, uh, but we have to, we have to um, demonstrate as a healthcare sector that we can accomplish that. Great, that, um, we're out of time and I actually think those are um, great concluding marks from Dr. McClellan and Governor Levitt. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, thank uh, you, may Dan. I just uh, thank all of the participants today uh, not just for their participation today, but many of you have put long hours and set uh, through many a session trying to uh, organize the uh, Accountable Care Learning Collaborative. We have a lot of work to do, and we desperately need you and others. So please uh, uh, continue on and uh, and encourage others. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I will just, uh, at the top, thank you for joining. Uh, appreciate all those. We will have a recording of the webinar available on our portal where the slide deck will also be. Just a reminder again about the next webinar on June 7th on Medicaid ACOs and our member meeting uh, in October the 23rd and, and uh, 24th. One thing that's not listed here, but I'll remind you those in work groups, uh, the work groups are underway and they meet um, once a month on Tuesdays. The next one is a week from today. Um, and that's Finance Committee uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern, HIT at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, Care Delivery at 2 p.m. Eastern, and Governance at 3 p.m. Eastern. If you have any questions about those or need registration for them, you can respond to really anyone. Jacqueline's the main point of contact, but any email you have will we'll get to us. Thank you uh, all for joining us. We hope you found value and uh, enjoy your Tuesday. <laughs>